My name is Philippe Simé. I'm a philosopher, and I'm interested in how architecture shapes and defines our lifestyles. I'm taking you with me to explore some of the most unusual living environments on the planet, to better understand what's behind them and share what they have to offer. I'm in Nepal, in Mustang district, northwest of Kathmandu. It's here that the citadel of Lomantang sits on a plateau at an altitude of 4,000 meters. The walled town was founded by a Tibetan king, Amepal, in the late 14th century. It lies on the Salt Road, once an important trade route linking the plateaus of Tibet to the valley of the river Ganges. Formerly the capital of the kingdom of Mustang, Lo Mantong is now totally cut off from the rest of the world, lost in the solitude of the Himalayas. Despite the altitude, the extreme cold, the raging winds, and the vast distances separating them from civilization, 800 people live here all year round. They are the Lobas. The town is a two-hour helicopter flight from Kathmandu. It would have taken me three days to get here by car. I wonder how the Lobas managed to live their daily lives here in total isolation. Bathed by an early spring light and surrounded by snow-covered mountains, Lu Montang seems intact, preserved as though the harshness of the elements had no hold over it. I head to the entrance of the town to meet one of its inhabitants. I want to find out how daily life is set up within its walls. Namaste. Hello. Welcome to Lo Mantong. Let me take you to my home. Thank you. Let's go. Karma Angel Guru has always lived in Lo Mantong, like the majority of inhabitants. He rears yaks, horses, and goats, and lives in one of the town's oldest houses. The streets are incredibly narrow. Yes, and there are lots of them with very high walls to protect us from the wind. In Mustang district, the winds can blow at over 70 kilometers an hour. The outer wall, called Chagri, also gives the town its shape. Most of the houses back onto it and are not allowed to be built higher than the wall. Karma takes me through the maze of streets which he knows like the back of his hand. Here we are. This is my house. It's really beautiful. According to Tibetan tradition, we decorate houses with several colors. Yellow for wisdom, white for compassion, and blue for protection. And the green, what does that represent? Oh. Nothing at all. I just added it because it looks nice. Let's go inside. We store our food downstairs, our grain and the meat we dry. And we live upstairs where it's warmer. Philippe, this is my wife, Tashi Agmo Gurung. Namaste. Have you always lived in Lomantang? Yes, I was born and raised here. And the town hasn't changed a bit. It's still protected by its walls. It has survived the test of time because everyone has joined together in preserving its structure and its resources. 
The buildings of Lomantang are well preserved, but has there been much change in the lifestyle of the inhabitants? Yes, there have been changes. We only have the strict minimum here, and it's hard to make a living. So in the winter, the youngsters go down into the city to open stores and earn money before coming back here with the things we lack. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Before, in the winter, the Lobas used to leave their town and go down onto the plains to trade. In a way, young men and women are continuing the tradition, which keeps the town stocked up. I've never left here, not even in winter. When the temperature gets too low, I drink a lot of hot tea. It's butter tea. We add salt to it to give us strength. <laughs> You're stronger afterwards. Yes. Thanks. Go ahead. Taste my butter tea. It's very different. <laughs> True. It takes some getting used to. Surrounded by the high peaks of the Himalayas, Lomontang doesn't benefit from the monsoon like the rest of Nepal. A climatic specificity that limits agriculture to one harvest a year, mainly grains like wheat, barley, and buckwheat. The rearing of yaks, horses, and goats completes the Loba's meager resources. In this desert at altitude, rain is scarce, so water management needs to be strictly controlled to have enough for household purposes and to irrigate the fields. Inside the town, this vital resource is distributed via an ingenious system of water conduits. Karma's son, Tsuong, is one of the townspeople who keeps the system running smoothly. Lu Montong is located close to a spring. I guess it's a very precious resource. Our water comes from the peaks of the Himalayas. But it's very scarce, so we have to be extremely careful with it. The town's water supply is managed by a group of six people, and I'm one of them. It's my job to make sure the water is distributed correctly. Today we're directing towards that land there. But in a few days' time, we'll redirect it elsewhere. If the water level drops, I have to quickly find out what's causing it. Someone might be diverting it, or an object might be blocking the conduits. The town needs a regular supply of water because we use it to wash our clothes and dishes. The conduits are also crucial if ever there's an outbreak of fire. The streets follow the slope of the terrain and the network of conduits so that inhabitants have easy access to water. Any surplus is collected in a reservoir and filtered for drinking water. The Lobas consider this resource as a common asset, and this water ensures the sustainability of Lomantang. When you live in a place as isolated as this, everyone has to contribute to preserving the town. The two most important things we need to preserve in Lomantang are water and the walls. If I notice that part of the wall near my house is damaged, I repair it.
This wall was first built in the late 14th century to protect us from attack coming from China or Ladakh. Fortunately, we're not at war anymore, but the wall is still vital to the town. When there's an earthquake, it's the wall that keeps the houses standing. So that's why all the inhabitants maintain it. <laughs> Repairing the clay brick wall requires a simple technique which Tsuwang masters well. Like all the inhabitants of Lomantang, he does maintenance work several times a year. It's just earth and water. Yes, earth which I collected from a field. I just have to make sure there's no straw or stones in it. Go on, Philippe. Try laying a brick. OK, this one? Careful, it's heavy. So the bricks are simply left to dry? Yes, because at this altitude, wood is scarce, so we can't fire the bricks. That's why we've always used this technique. Once dry, we shape them. Yeah. And now you fill in the gaps. Yes. We cover them with clay. Hey. You have to pat it in and smooth it quickly or it doesn't hold. This is really the original technique. This technique works perfectly well, so we continue to use it. Plus, we want to keep the wall in its original state. I see. Well, it's starting to hold, but there's still lots to do. <laughs> yes, I'll carry on tomorrow. In Lumontang, there are walls everywhere, thick yet fragile at the same time, casting intangible shadows and colors that change as the sun turns in the sky. The walls symbolize the Loba's struggle to keep their culture alive while confronted by the short-lived nature of the clay and the ravages of time. This evening, Karma has invited me to dinner at his house, a chance for me to see what the Lobas eat and how they cook it. In their own way, the dishes of Mustang reflect the harshness of life in this arid, barren land. Is this the only heated room? Hardly anyone has electricity here. It's not like in your country. We don't have radiators. At this altitude, there's no wood or coal to heat the homes, so we use yak dung. We leave it to dry and then feed the stove with it. So we spend a lot of time in this room. We've adapted to our climate. I have something to show you. It's a prayer wheel. It contains mantras, the teachings of Buddha. Oh, yes. The rolls of mantras are inside. That's right. There are lots of them. Ah! It's very filling. It fills you up. It's a traditional dish, mashed buckwheat. It's really good. You add some yak butter. Oh, right, some butter. And you make little balls. Like this? Go on, tuck in. OK, I make little balls and dip them in the sauce, right? Yep. What do you think? Mmm, really good. OK. OK. We'll finish dinner, and then it's time for bed. OK, very well. Karm is right. At 4,000 meters altitude, the day's activities take their toll. 
fatigue soon overcomes the body, despite the loba's incredible robustness and resilience. In this walled town, high up in the mountains, religion has a central place in life. All Lobas are practicing Tibetan Buddhists. Temples and other religious buildings are the keystone of their culture. Yet they have left them to fall into disrepair due to a lack of means. But restoration work is finally underway, thanks to financial backing from a foundation in the United States and the skills of expert restorer Luigi Fieni. I didn't expect to run into an Italian in Lo Montang. How did you end up working here? I'm kind of here by chance. Really? In 1999, I thought I'd be here working on a project for a few months. But it turned into 19 years, and I'm still here. <laughs> That's quite a long time. It is. It's part of my life now. I get the impression that the buildings require a lot of maintenance. They're all built in clay, which is a material that needs constant upkeep. Every year they paint their houses with a layer of liquid clay to protect them from the winds and the rain. On the top of the weather, there are unpredictable events like the earthquake of 2015. Did it destroy a lot of buildings here? Quite a few. The structures are in clay, which absorbs most of the shocks, but the houses and buildings are full of cracks. They've been weakened. Exactly. What led you to start restoring the monastery in particular? When the foundation came here, they asked the Lobas what they needed. They thought they would say a hospital, a school, etc. But their answer was completely different. They said, if you really want to help us, our culture is found on religion, so start by restoring our monasteries. At first, it was a nightmare, but it has turned into a real gift because helping the people restore their buildings and safeguard their culture is an incredible experience. Luigi is teaching the inhabitants how to conserve their architectural heritage. He shows me the work going on in the Tubshen Temple, the largest of the four temples in the town. This is the entrance to the monastery. What are they up there? Dragons? They're lions. They're found in a lot of monasteries because they protect them from evil spirits and demons. Will they let us in? Oh, there's a good chance. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Wow, it's really magnificent. Yes, this room is really vast. It's amazing. When was it built? It was consecrated in 1472. It was the main monastery of the Lo Manthang community. There were several religious buildings here, but the most important was Thubchen. When we first came in here, everything was covered in varnish, paint, and clay had run from the ceiling, and most of the paintings were very badly damaged. You see that Buddha? It had lost its knees. We started by working on the existing original paint, and we taught the locals how to restore it. But when they saw the results, they said, OK, it's beautiful, it's very colourful, but there are things missing. The knees, the hands, the feet, so we can't pray to it. So now we're restoring the whole thing and replacing the missing pieces because the locals want a real living monastery and not a museum. To allow lay people into this holy place, a monk had to perform a ceremony before work could begin. Using a mirror, he captured the soul of each divinity present in the frescoes. This strange procedure deconsecrates the images, so they are no longer spiritual and no longer inhabited by the divine. They're simply material traces. 
a clever way of authorizing the inhabitants, and notably women who are considered impure, to touch the works, remove the pigments, and proceed with their restoration. Yandoka. <laughs> Bonjour. Namaste. Namaste. Restoring a monastery like this is a mammoth task. It's true, it's a huge amount of work. We started by cleaning all the columns and the ceiling. We followed that up by cleaning the walls before starting the first work on the paintings. We're so lucky to have been taught the techniques of restoration. Now we can protect the heritage and culture of our town by ourselves. Before becoming a restorer, what was your job? Before starting in the monastery as a painter, I worked mainly in the fields. These days, I do both. I go out early in the morning to feed the cattle, and I spend the rest of the time in here. The way the Lobas have taken their cultural and religious heritage into their own hands is remarkable. This temple is their most precious monument. They decided to make it their own and restore it in their own way so as to remain its masters and keep it alive. The town will therefore remain a religious capital and a pilgrimage destination for Buddhists. Paradoxically, religion now brings thousands of pilgrims to Lo Montang, where in the 7th century, it was the need for solitude and silence that led Tibetan Buddhism to establish itself here. One of the monks, Fung Chuk, offers to show me what's left of Konchuk Ling Cave, carved out of the rock some 800 years ago. So three centuries before the founding of Lo Mantang, holy men were already coming here to meditate. The people of Lo Mantang weren't the first to settle up here in the mountains. Here there are thousands of caves where men came in search of isolation. The cave we're going to is very difficult to reach. The horse can't go any further. We'll continue on foot. The climb is exhausting, and the lack of oxygen is cruelly felt. But walking, with my body in pain and my breath faltering, brings me immeasurable pleasure as we near the summit. Here we are, Philippe, at Konchok Ling Cave. We made it. Are you okay? Fine. As you can see, the walls of the cave are covered in 13th century paintings. They're of the Mahasiddhas, mythical Indian figures that influenced Tibetan Buddhism. The Konchok Ling paintings prove that in the 11th century, the great accomplished lived here. It's the perfect place of isolation to achieve awakening. These wall paintings from bygone days tell us of the fervor of the cave's first occupants, their quest to approach the divine and to inhabit these mountains spiritually. It's magnificent. Does living at such an altitude develop a certain type of culture and spirituality? This region was Buddhist long before the kingdom of Lo Montong was founded. The monks lived in caves dug out by ancient populations. 
Mm. Most of them were very difficult to reach as they are situated up in the middle of the cliffs or mountains. The Himalayas are the expression of the divine. They have a paramount place in Buddhism. Ancient texts mention the Himalayas as a unique and holy place, the preferred place of spiritual masters. The very starting point of Buddhism is meditation. The closer one gets to the sky, the closer one is to the gods. Looking out from the top of this mountain, at high altitude, I seem to better understand what ties the Lobas to this beautiful yet demanding land, isolation. Not as a constraint, but as a way of finding a place in this vast landscape, suspended in time, of forgetting oneself in order to find oneself. A way of living and meditating, which brings back to me what Jean-Jacques Rousseau called the pure sentiment of existence, the discovery of one's own presence in the evidence of the world. My name is Philippe Simé. I'm a philosopher, and I'm interested in what architecture can tell us about our lifestyles. I'll take you to explore some of the most remarkable habitats on the planet in order to discover their meaning and to share their riches. I'm in Yangshui in eastern Myanmar, a two-hour flight from Rangoon, the capital. This port town is the main access point for Inlay Lake, the country's second largest. 22 kilometers long by 10 kilometers wide, it's home to the Inta, the region's majority ethnic group, numbering an estimated 200,000. Five hundred years ago, displaced by tribal wars, the Inta found refuge on the lake and over the centuries developed a way of life in harmony with its waters. Crossing Inlay Lake, which stretches for 116 square kilometers among the Shan Hills, I head to the southern end, to the village of Puk Par. As in all the villages on and around the lake, the Inta have developed water-based economic activities here. But pollution and the influx of tourists have weakened the ecosystem on which their livelihood depends. Houses, businesses, schools, here everything is on stilts and surrounded by water. How do the local people preserve the harmony of their singular way of life? I'm on my way to visit Menge who comes from a long line of farmers and fishermen. She was born here and still lives far from dry land in one of these houses perched on stilts above the water. Hello. Hello. Thank you for welcoming me. You're welcome. My house is made of bamboo. I can see. It's all bamboo. The whole house is made of bamboo. There are about 30 stilts in all supporting the house. They're three meters long and the house is three meters high. I guess the water level changes with the seasons, right? That's right. The water will be up to here soon, and by the end of the rainy season, it can come right up to the upper deck. I see. That's why there are these different levels, the two pontoons and then the stairs. 
Would you like to see the house? I'd love to. I love this staircase. I'll take my shoes off. Wow. This is my son. Ah, hello. He's a fisherman. I'm Philippe. Hello. Hello. What are you doing? I'm mending my nets. A huge room. This is the living room. Yeah? We all live here with my son and his wife. And that's the room where everyone sleeps. Oh, right, okay. That's my son and his wife's bed. That's mine. And that's my grandson's bed. Don't the bamboo poles and the water rot? How long do they last? The stilts last about two years. Then we have to replace them. The bamboo partitions last five years. When I renovate my house, I put all my belongings in a pile in the corner, I remove the old bamboo and replace it. So you basically rebuild your house bit by bit? Yes. I use a small axe to cut this pole, say, without touching the partition. Ah. Okay, I see. I remove it and I replace it with a new pole. Right, and you can cut it, untie these knots and reassemble it. That's great. Up there too, I replace the bamboo. Right. My son is also a carpenter. He and his friends built the house. The symbolic, religious aspect, the cardinal points, all that, seem to be important in the organization of space here. They are. For instance, when we sleep, we face Buddha's altar, so east. I see. To show your respect to Buddha. Yes, because Buddha is sacred. That's why we face the altar. These wood and bamboo houses are proof of the Inta's permanent struggle to make the lake habitable, as if it were a matter of controlling this vast expanse of water. In the village, the houses are arranged parallel to each other, in the manner of crisscrossing streets forming a vast waterway network. But it isn't easy to find your way around this nameless maze. Ong Tu, Menge's son, offers to take me out in his dugout to explore the village and its layout. I was born and raised in this village. Is that a school? Yes, the village school. I went there when I was little. But I had to leave when I was five and start working to support my family. I became a fisherman first, then I learned carpentry. But I've always fished. I'm totally lost now. How do you find your way around? I don't need street names to work out where I am. I know the occupants of every house, so I always find my way around. How many people live here? I'd say 200 families. You associate all the places in the village with people's names? That's amazing. We have to go to the store. There? Yes. This is the first store I've seen. We'll dock alongside there. Thanks. Hello? Hello. You've got everything here. Yes, we have potato chips, oil. Oil, rice, biscuits, noodles? Yes, noodles too. I love these. I eat them all the time. This is great. This is the village's main grocery store, and the people from the neighboring village do their shopping here too. How do you get your supplies? Do you have everything delivered? I get my supplies at the market, then I bring everything back here by dugout. 
I'm going to get a snack. Okay, great. I don't like that. I'll take this. What is it? Fried rice. Rice? Oh, great. It looks tasty. Okay. Well, I think we're good. Thank you. Goodbye. Hello, Tue. Hello. I'm coming. There, I'm in. We've got to go. I'll be meeting up with Ong Tu again later. Right now, I'm going out to the lake with Tue, his cousin, and her friend, Ken Mar, who are both farmers. The lake governs the Inta's life. It enables them to get around, to transport goods, and above all, to feed themselves. It's hard to imagine agricultural practices in water. And yet, the Inta have developed a singular technique to make that possible. Floating gardens, man-made strips of land for vegetable growing. So this is a floating garden? It looks as if it's firmly attached to the ground. Yes, we grow all our vegetables here. Aubergines, tomatoes, cucumbers, and even flowers. It's a skill that's passed down from generation to generation. How do you make these gardens? We collect blocks of turf on the shore, cut them into strips, then line them up. Everyone makes their own plot. And then underneath, we add a thick layer of freshwater algae, which enables the roots to go right to the bottom of the lake. If the garden wasn't attached, it would move in the wind. Whereas with this system, it can't drift. These floating gardens now cover one quarter of Inlay Lake and represent the Inta people's main source of income. They supply the rest of the country with vegetables. Do we have tomatoes to pick? Yes, it's tomato season right now. They're a bit hard, though. I imagine they'll ripen later. Thank you. No, they're ripe. It's a variety of green tomato. These look good. Yes, perfect. I can see these huge gardens stretching for miles. Who do they actually belong to? They belong to the villages. Everyone owns a plot. But the authorities determine the overall size of the gardens. We're not allowed to go beyond a specific limit. In the middle of the lake, it's forbidden. You must be very proud of your production. Yes, because we don't just produce for ourselves. It's become our main source of income, too. We produce in large quantities. And if I can earn six euros for a big bag, that's great. To get all of these tomatoes to grow, do you need chemical fertilizers or pesticides? We use less pesticide now than we used to. We've reduced its use by about a third. But if we didn't use any, all the vegetables would have black holes in them like this. We're aware pesticides are harmful for man, but without them, we'd lose our entire crop. Hey, we've got quite a few here. Yes, you're right, we have enough. We'll go sell them in the village. Right. We're not going to the market. No, I prefer to sell them in the village. Who wants tomatoes? I do, over here. We're coming, hang on. How many do you want? I'd like a kilo. A kilo. She wants a kilo. Okay, green or red? A mixture. A mixture? Okay. There you go. In fact, this is a home delivery service, but on water. Absolutely. Do you see water as something you have to constantly make concessions to, or is it more of an ally? 
We're tied to the lake like a baby to its mother. I can't imagine living without the water. I can't earn a living or get around without it. Just seeing the lake fills me with joy. After hours out on the water, I now understand the Inta's intimate relationship with the lake. For me, water is an obstacle, whereas here, it's what unites the whole community. A key element of this union are the dugouts. Fitted with outboard motors or oars, they're everywhere. Going in all directions, they leave their wake all over the surface, yet the lake remains impassive. Ong Tu needs to repair his dugout before going fishing. I accompany him to his neighborhood workshop. Hi, Hi. Hello. <laughs> You're building a new dugout? Uh, yes, to carry passengers. Yeah. How long does it take to make a dugout like this? It takes a week to make the basic structure and about a month to finish it completely. Seeing as you order the wood in, I guess it costs you a fair amount to start with. Oh yes, a lot. It's about $1,500 per cubic meter. And so how much does a dugout like this cost? $2,500 without the motor. That's a considerable sum for a family. For sure. Okay. You're mixing it. This recipe has been in my family forever. We mix three ingredients, sap, sand, and coir. That's a huge pestle. Let's paint. I love this. I love this kind of work. What do people mainly order these days? Dugouts for fishing or dugouts to transport tourists? I make three sorts, for fishing, agriculture, and tourism. And in the past few years, have you seen a change in demand? Yes, absolutely. Since Myanmar opened up, we've been selling more and more dugouts for tourism. A lot of travel agencies and hotel owners are buying dugouts to hire them out. Isn't there a danger this demand will change the way the Inta people live on the lake? Let's say, so far, the growth in tourism has been beneficial for us. But consumption is increasing and everything is becoming expensive. Prices have doubled. The increase in tourism the expansion of agricultural land and global warming all impact the lake's fragile ecosystem. Right, let's go. The Inta have a unique way of fishing, but their livelihood is threatened by falls in the water level to a mere two meters deep in the dry season. Nevertheless, Ong Tu and his uncle continue to fish. It's really amazing because I can barely stand. And there you are, setting up the nets and rowing at the same time. It's easy. It's easy for you, not for me. This is an ancient technique for trapping fish. My grandfather taught me. It's passed down from generation to generation. Haha, <laughs> <laughs> I caught a fish. Ah, uh, yes, I can see it. I'm happy when a fish gets caught in my nets. I love it. There are far fewer now than there used to be. We catch two or three kilos a day. Before it was 20 or 30 kilos. Why have things changed? Why are there fewer fish? It's because of the fall in the water level. Do some fishermen have to find other sources of income then? Yes, of course. 
we have to do other things. We take tourists out for rides in our dugouts, for instance. Inlay Lake is a place where man, nature, and agriculture have long existed in harmony. But this unique ecosystem is now under threat. The lake is drying up, shrinking in size, and becoming increasingly polluted. It's vital the community wakes up and takes action. The venerable Sandardika has used his authority as a Buddhist monk to fight for environmental change for several years now. You yourself are Inta. You were born here. How have you seen the lake change? You know, I grew up here in a village on the lake. I can clearly remember when I was small that the water was turquoise. It was so pure you could see through it. We even used to drink it. The water is so full of chemicals now, we wouldn't even dare rinse our hands in it. To help me understand the other danger threatening the lake, Santardika tells me we have to go into the forest. According to him, intensified logging has seriously diminished its protective role toward the lake. With no trees to hold the water back, sediment flows in ever greater quantities into the rivers feeding the lake, gradually reducing its depth. God, it's pouring. In just a few seconds, we've seen tons and tons of earth pouring into the water. How is this possible? It is because of deforestation and slash and burn techniques. Now when it rains, the soil isn't held in place by the forest. Is this deforestation due to intensive agriculture or are there other factors as well? There are several causes. Since our grandparents' day, the population has risen sharply. We need more agricultural land to feed everyone, as well as more wood to build houses. This is on top of the El Nino effect. Rainfall has increased significantly. The plants suffer and end up dying. But are the local residents supporting you in your initiative? What has to happen is for all the people living on and around the lake to get together and replant the forest. It is the only way we will protect the lake. And for this, I've set up an organization with young volunteers. Little by little, we're getting there. Thank you so much. Sandar Dika has come up with all sorts of initiatives to involve the villagers in the lake's preservation. These include collecting the different types of waste that are building up on its surface. What types of waste are polluting the lake? Plastic bags, water hyacinths, and also waste from the floating gardens. The tourists leave a lot of trash behind, but so do the locals. During the cleanup campaigns, the custom is for each family to send a volunteer to help clear the waste. It's obvious the lake is changing very quickly. I was wondering if there was a real awareness among the local population or not. Yes, of course. Inta means children of the lake. The lake is our mother. That means we cannot survive without it. We owe it everything. The Inta's special relationship with the lake influences every aspect of their lives, including their beliefs. Predominantly Buddhist, they also worship the lake spirit, one of the 37 gnats of the ancient animist tradition. 
Today is the start of the Fong Dao O Pagoda's annual festival. It is the most important religious event of the year, and I'm lucky enough to be here. I meet up with Anne, a local hotel owner who's very involved in her community. This is very beautiful. Did you do all of this? Yes. On the first day of the festival, I make an offering to Buddha. And I offer a full meal to all my relatives, friends, colleagues and employees. The festival has existed for 400 years, and my family has always participated in the ceremony. This festival is an occasion for great popular rejoicing, isn't it? People have been arriving since dawn for the ceremony. Yes, there are a lot of people. 98% of Inta are Buddhist. You know, by following Buddha, we will be rewarded at the moment of reincarnation. All the lake's residents gather for this week-long festival. Statues of Buddha are taken out of the pagoda and transported by boat from village to village, so associating this celebration with that of the water spirit. Do you think the life of the Inta is inseparable from the life of the lake? For us, it's obvious. This lake is our land. My home is here. It's the same thing for all the Inta, even those who have moved elsewhere. The lake is always in our hearts. The Inta are known as the children of the lake for good reason. They contribute fully to its beauty. The daily activities, which they learn in childhood and pass on from generation to generation, merge with the lake, making them one and the same. With the lake more and more affected by environmental and economic change, this unity is now under threat. Will the Inta preserve this balance? Such is their grace as they glide across the lake's water. I'm more than certain that they will. Right, I think I'll get some candy. Which is the good candy? Fantastic. This looks great. We'll have these. Do you like really spicy things or not too much? Spicy. I knew it. Yeah. I can't eat spicy food. Ah, uh, it doesn't agree with me either. Nah, we're the same.